He was a war hero and a dashing Greek-born prince, brimming with boundless energy and ambition. He's a very unflappable sort of character. He's a real leader. Yet when he married Princess Elizabeth in 1947, his life changed forever. And when she was crowned queen, his role became to serve and support her. Prince Philip had to bow down and pay homage to his wife. I, Philip, am your liege man of life and limb. It's a role he's dedicated almost 70 years to. It's been a challenge for us, but by trial and experience, I believe we have achieved a sensible division of labor. Why did he choose this life? And how have the requirements of duty sat with a man who is fiercely independent, opinionated, and self-sufficient? He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. He's a curious mixture of being blunt, really quite rude at times, and very sentimental, very deep thinking, very inquisitive. Just how did Philip carve out a role as the king without a crown? August 2017, and in the forecourt of Buckingham Palace, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, is undertaking his last solo public engagement before retirement, a parade of the Royal Marines. He is 96 years old. It's over 70 years after his first official outing. In those years, he's packed in over 22,000 such events. He's been admirable in every sense and been completely supportive of the Queen, and she would be the first to say that she really would have been very difficult to do it without him. There is this sense that she's only really been able to be as successful on the throne because she's had Prince Philip by her side supporting her. For those who believe that the monarchy is of some use to this country, he's an immensely important and influential figure. It's been a long, strange journey for the boy, born a virtually penniless prince of the Greek royal family in 1921. The thing about Prince Philip is that he never really had a home, or at least not for very long. Although he was born in Corfu, on the kitchen table, he wasn't there for very long and the family went into exile. They lived in Paris until he was about eight, but then when his mother became ill, his father decided to kind of close down the house. He suffered so much. His mother had been locked up in an asylum. His father had been an unfaithful man and pretty much left Philip to fend. They just pushed him around like a parcel. Relatives and benefactors paid for his schooling in Scotland. And then influenced by his mentor, Lord Mountbatten, the young Philip opted for a naval career, enrolling at the training academy in Dartmouth. Health and muscular control are still important branches of naval training. The disciplined military environment suited Philip's temperament and provided some stability, something his own family had been unable to do. He was a very outdoorsy person. He loved playing cricket. He enjoyed running. He was always very competitive, so he enjoyed sport uh, as long as he won. Philip became a star cadet and was an obvious candidate to entertain the two young princesses, Elizabeth and Margaret, when their parents, the king and queen, came to visit. While they were at the captain's house, in walked Prince Philip, who sort of suggested that they go outside. Princess Elizabeth was enraptured, and she never really took her eyes off, off him for, for, for the whole visit. She was just entranced by him. She was 13, he was 18, and he was this glamorous, handsome, young Viking naval cadet about to go off to war. I mean, how was that not going to win the heart of this young girl? There was no way that she wasn't going to fall in love with him. But with war in Europe starting only months later, events soon took over their budding friendship as Philip sailed off to do battle. He saw action as an officer on HMS Valiant in the Battle of Matapan in the Mediterranean in 1941, where the British fleet trounced the Italian Navy. He quitted himself with, with great sort of bravery and great quickness of thought, and he was definitely seen as one of the, the, the rising stars. And as the war drew to an end, Philip fully expected to continue his rapid promotion through the naval ranks. He certainly had a good war, and of course, a young, good-looking naval officer um, who'd had a good war 
absolutely the epitome of everything that was respected, respectable and wonderful come 1945. He's peculiarly well suited for the Navy. I mean, seamanship and you know, navigation and everything came naturally to him. But also, he absolutely loved um, naval life. It was a, a family for him. And on the home front, his friendship with Princess Elizabeth, who was by now 19, had turned into a fully-fledged romance. Not everyone was happy with this turn of events. The courtiers, the household, the royal family, even government, there was a feeling that he just wasn't the right character for the job. It was said that he was ill-tempered, he was rough, and he was not inclined to be faithful. And really, I think, a dependent man there were a lot of um, suspicions about him. Um, of course, as you can imagine, because uh, if you look at his ancestry, there is a lot of German blood there. I think the king's concerns were more that his daughter was too young, really, to marry. He didn't want to lose her so soon. He liked Philip, but liking someone and having them as a prospective husband for your daughter are two very different things. And he felt that she needed to see the world a little bit Partly to test the strength of her feelings for Philip, Princess Elizabeth was packed off with her parents on their 1947 tour of South Africa. Simple fact is that no matter how many times Elizabeth was told that Philip wasn't quite right, she'd look elsewhere. She didn't listen. She'd been set on Philip from the age of 13. He was the perfect husband for her. And actually, the more people tried to dissuade Elizabeth from marrying Philip, the more she became set on it. Despite the subtle, or not so subtle, arm twisting of establishment figures, on the 9th of July 1947 came the announcement that changed everything. In these, the first special studies of the pair since the news of their engagement, it's easy to see the radiant happiness of the princess as she and her very good looking husband to be pose for the cameras in the palace. They both fell in love with each other. Princess Elizabeth was clear that this was the man she absolutely loved. And I th I'm sure she made that very clear to her parents. And so I think that was probably, ultimately, the, the, what sort of swung it, really. Philip slipped into his new role, supporting his fiancée, Princess Elizabeth, on her official duties. I am so happy that on this, my third visit, my future husband is by my side. He was the semi-destitute prince who had won the hand of the most eligible bride in Europe, if not the world, and with it an invitation to join a secure and settled family, very different from his own chaotic upbringing. But as he was to find out, the decision to marry Princess Elizabeth came at a price. The 20th of November, 1947, and all eyes were on Westminster Abbey. Thousands had assembled overnight, all eagerly waiting to see and to cheer the royal processions on this day of their own princess's marriage. Churchill described it like the first bit of colour to sort of happen after the war. It helped to cheer everyone up. You know, London was still a sort of bomb site, basically. Rationing was still in place. People had gone through a difficult time during the war. The country was, was drained and, and exhausted, yes, absolutely exhausted. In 1947, people became swept up with the euphoria of it and suddenly this wedding of this gorgeous young couple was something that people could focus on. There's this beautiful wedding with a lovely gown and bridesmaids and all the things people had missed in the 40s and the, and the late 30s. But when it came to compiling the guest list, there was one decision that indicated just how sensitive the establishment was to Philip's background. Prince Philip's sisters were not invited to the wedding because they were married to quite high-ranking German officers, and one a member of the SS. His father had died during the war, so the only member of his family there was his mother. It was a decision that deprived him of family support on the big day. I think he was a little hurt, but it was probably the right decision because there was still a very, very strong anti-German feeling in this country. It must have been very difficult for him, but I guess he just went with the flow, basically. There were, certainly, there's no evidence of any arguments about it. There was a sort of feeling that he was up against it. 
had a sort of fight on his hands um, during the early years of his marriage and to sort of establish himself, find a role for himself and a role in the country, really. Every father will understand this father's pride and delight in his young son. And almost a year later, Charles, the heir to the throne, was born. But for Philip, there was another indication of where the real power lay. It had been decided by Churchill and others that the couple's children wouldn't take his family name, Mountbatten, but hers, Windsor. He said, you know, I'm nothing but a bloody amoeba. Some sort of happier compromise um, might, might have been found, but I think it definitely, you know, it, it, it created problems in the marriage, I think. Now, Prince Philip um, did actually argue against this, so I, I think it was an unhappy moment for him. As life settled down, Philip faced the question, what was his new role? He made a few tentative forays onto the public stage. Boxing at the Royal Albert Hall, and the Duke of Edinburgh was the guest of honour at the London Boys Club Championships. I'd like to say how delighted I am in that capacity to see this hall so full of people who obviously well wishes of the London Federation Boys Clubs and of the Boys Clubs throughout Great Britain. But what he really wanted was to continue his highly successful naval career. And that meant a stint as an instructor. Lieutenant Mountbatten returns to the Naval Training Centre at Corsham, where he's an instructor at the Petty... It wasn't his thing. He wanted to be out there commanding on active service. So desk jobs, teaching, administration, that really wasn't the job he wanted. Malta greets the arrival of Princess Elizabeth. His luck changed when he was posted to Malta in 1949. It was famously what they described as their happiest it was a place where they could be free and people didn't gawp at them and it was a very lovely time for them in, in all sorts of ways and a very fulfilling one for him professionally as well. They were young. They were in love. They um, had frankly dumped their children with the grandparents and were having a good time. Princess Elizabeth was able to be the wife of around in her little car. They danced in the Phoenicia Hotel just outside Valletta. They went to polo matches, he played, and uh, they had a lovely time, basically. The only cloud on the Mediterranean horizon was the deteriorating health of King George VI. The nation's concern at His Majesty's illness is reflected in the crowd of loyal sympathizers gathered in the rain outside the palace to offer their own personal tributes. The king's health broke down very soon after the war. There were state visits when Princess Elizabeth had to make his speech, when the Queen Mother would be greeting, as it were, the King of Norway, uh, and the king didn't even leave his room. So the ill health of the king uh, curtailed Prince Philip's um, naval career. Philip tried to reconcile being pulled in two directions at once, a desire to continue with the naval career he obviously loved and the duty to support his wife. The Duke of Edinburgh, who of course holds the rank of commander, Royal Navy, went to Chatham to unveil the World War II extension to the Naval War Memorial. I'm particularly proud to do this because, like all of us who served in the Navy during the war, I lost many friends and shipmates who are commemorated here. As the King's health worsened, Philip's dual role became increasingly difficult to balance. It was decided the young couple should undertake a tour of the Commonwealth in place of the King. When you look at the pictures of the King bidding farewell to his daughter, people must have wondered a little bit whether they would ever see each other again. Although Elizabeth and Philip were deputising for the King, they didn't necessarily know how ill he was. I think that both Elizabeth and Philip thought that he would continue, although much weakened in health, for many years to come. And it was while the Duke and Princess Elizabeth were staying in a lodge in Kenya that news came through which changed Philip's life forever. The death of George VI was a huge shock. Prince Philip looked as though the world had ended. It meant the end of his free life, really. And uh, this was a sort of moment which he knew was going to happen at one stage, but he had sort of... And it fell to Philip to break the news to Elizabeth. Prince Philip took the Queen for a walk, and that's when he told her that she'd become Queen. Elizabeth had always been so devoted to her father, and to tell her in the middle of a tour that her father was dead and she had to go back to be Queen must have been a quite devastating job. 
the tour was abandoned and the couple returned to the UK, leaving their old lives behind in Africa. They flew back almost immediately, and there's that very poignant pictures of the Queen coming down the steps in black as a young queen almost coming to claim her kingdom. For Philip, this was the moment when he realized that he was now going to be consort, and his role now was to walk two steps behind the queen. And it was really a very difficult moment for him. I think it would be difficult for many men in the 50s to have to walk behind their wives to be the consort, to be the support. Had he been allowed to continue with his career, he might very well have reached the position of the most senior man in the Navy, because people who sailed with him did think that he had the talent, possibly, to have become First Sea Lord on his own merits. He'd just been promoted in the Navy, in the Royal Navy. The best years were ahead, he said later, but he had to give it up. He had to be at the Queen's side. Um, and it was a massive sacrifice for him. Just over a year later, Queen Elizabeth was crowned in Westminster Abbey. It was a fantastic and glorious occasion, the like of which will never be seen again, because there simply aren't all those people in uniform anymore, I'm afraid. But uh, it was, no, it was wonderful, a wonderful occasion and uh, very exciting. And this time, Philip, as chairman of the Coronation Commission, was able to ensure his three sisters were on the guest list to witness the extraordinary pageant. Prince Philip had to bow down and pay homage to his wife, and he said he was her liege lord. Faith and truth I will bear unto you, to live and die against all manner of folks, so help me God. That was a symbolic moment when he really had decided that his life was going to be dedicated to her life, which was dedicated to the monarchy. So basically, they'd both given up everything for duty because there was no point in her giving up everything for duty if he wasn't prepared to do the same and support her. He was completely happy to kneel before his wife and he just went through it like everybody else. The course of the rest of Philip's life was now set to serve the crown and the queen. Is due home tomorrow from his tour of South America, a tour of 60 days and 36,000 miles. With characteristic energy, Philip threw himself into making royal visits abroad. He was never going to be the sort of person who would be happy, sort of just slinking away to Balmoral or Sandringham and sort of spending his life shooting pheasants and, you know, pottering around the farm. So he developed a useful role promoting British business and technology. He gets nuclear reactors to glass-blowing factories, factories making all kinds of products all over Britain. Philip had a really personal interest in the technology and intricacies of business and manufacturing. When Prince Philip first started making tours of inspection, his thoroughness was often inclined to startle. But now we're used to his rather specialised approach, and we see him here showing his particular interest in industry. Where he became very effective was going out and about and giving speeches, and his speeches were widely admired and sort of reported on press. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clearly our duty as citizens to see that science is used for the benefit of mankind. For what use is science if man does not survive? <clears throat> There's a sort of impatience in him, which is impatience with people who are stuck in their ways. He's innately curious, and I think that's a great attribute, actually. He's a man with acquired wisdom on very, very many subjects. And there's one initiative virtually everyone agrees was a great idea. The Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme proves that the life of modern youth isn't all pop music, long hair and punch-ups. He recently presented gold awards to 127 girls and over 750 boys. Since its launch in 1956, over six and a half million young adults have developed their confidence and skills by taking on physical, social and charitable challenges in their desire to earn a bronze, silver or gold award just got to talk to these young people who come from every walk of life and find out what they've done and the excitement they've done, the adventures they've had getting these awards, to realise that it is a great achievement that he started this scheme and it's very much of his character. The presentation took place in the gardens of Buckingham Palace, something of a thrill for all the youngsters. Whatever his personal feelings and frustrations, Philip was reconciled to his role supporting the Queen, was father to four children and the monarchy seemed secure for another 
generation. Philip's life seemed as settled as anyone's could be in his extraordinary position. But soon the settled life would be tested to its very limits, and the test would come from inside his own family. of the Queen's coronation marked the start of a new era for the monarchy. The year before had seen the Duke of Edinburgh and the Queen welcome the birth of their first grandchild to Princess Anne. But thoughts soon turned to Charles, the heir to the throne. Approaching his 30s and still single, Prince Philip was anxious for his son to settle down and maintain the line to the throne. It was his father who had made all the decisions about the children during their lifetime. He very much was the one in the family who wore the trousers. So I think the fact that the role fell to him to give him a kick up the backside, to say now was the time, he couldn't just swan around with any number of pretty girls on his arm. And so yes, it was probably natural for Prince Philip to take that role. When the Prince of Wales began courting Lady Diana Spencer, it seemed to many that he had met his match. But Charles was unsure. It fell to the Duke to urge his son to make a decision. Prince Charles and his dad are very different creatures. He's a pragmatist and Charles is a romantic. I don't think that Prince Philip has been unfeeling towards Charles ever, but I think he found that his son was dithering about whether he should marry this, uh, this young girl or not. There came a point when Prince Philip told Prince Charles to get on with it. And that is how a letter was written to Prince Charles. And what it actually said was, this girl is running a gauntlet every day of press and things. If you are going to marry her, I think it would be a good idea to get on with it. And if you're not, then probably it would be kinder to say so now, rather than to leave this thing in a limbo. Prince Charles felt himself to be very pressurised into it. 11 a.m., Buckingham Palace. The beginning of a day to remember for Prince Charles, Lady Diana, and for quite a lot of other people, too. Jolted into action by the Duke of Edinburgh, Charles proposed to Diana in February 1981. The two were married just five months later to the delight of the nation and millions around the world. But to Prince Philip's dismay, Charles and Diana's honeymoon period would be short-lived. The strains in their relationship were fully exposed during their trip to South Korea last month. The distance between them could not be disguised. The papers dubbed them the glums. Well, being a dad and being a father-in-law, he would have been pretty disappointed because he and the Queen have believed in the sanctity of marriage. There was disappointment that this great expectation in 1981 uh, of this mammoth wedding, which was everybody built it as a fairy tale wedding, should sort of suddenly crumble in, in the mid 80s. To counsel the once happy couple. He wrote letters in which he tried to be a marriage counselor, if you like, and she wrote back always saying, um, dearest pa was the way she started letters. And she said, I think you really underestimate your skills as a marriage counsellor. And she also said, whatever happens, I will know always that uh, you care. This is Prince Philip, husband, consort of the Queen, father of the Prince of Wales, who is heir to the throne. So he probably felt that it was uh, not just a family duty, but it was a public duty to try and get them to talk to each other, to reconcile and to save the marriage. No two marriages are quite alike. I think that the main lesson that we've learned is that tolerance is the one essential ingredient of any happy marriage. It may not be quite so important when things are going well, but it is absolutely vital when things get difficult. Despite Prince Philip's attempts to mediate, Charles and Diana separated in 1992. It is announced from Buckingham Palace that with regret, the Prince and Princess of Wales have decided to separate. It was just one of a series of marital setbacks to hit the royal family that year. The Yorks' apparent separation leaves two young children in an unprecedented position so close to the throne. To see your children go their separate ways and to suffer and to do so, so publicly, it was very difficult for them. Probably a little frustrated that they just couldn't get on with it because that's the kind of man he is. He's a man who gets on with things. I sometimes wonder how future generations 
judge the events of this tumultuous year. The marriage finally cracked amid rumors the princess had been secretly meeting the dashing naval commander, Tim Lawrence. He was exasperated that all these things were, were going on within the family, none of which was the fault of the queen or Prince Philip, but was having repercussions on the queen in, in, in that the media was saying, well, why can't she control her family? Well, if your son is 40 something, you don't tell a 40 year old how to behave. You hope that they're gonna be able to do it themselves. It has turned out to be an annus horribilis. But after the breakdown of three of their children's marriages, in November, there would be yet another blow to the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh. There are no words that can describe this scene. The sky aglow above Windsor tonight as a thousand years of history takes flame. The Windsor Castle fire was a huge personal tragedy for the Queen. Um, it's a much-loved home, and I remember being there and watching her in the courtyard the morning after the fire, walking amongst the, the smouldering timbers, and I felt really sorry for her. She seemed like a rather sad old lady at that moment but things got worse because the government said that they would pay the taxpayer in other words would pay for the repairs of when well, why should we pay government don't pay we pay the queen and prince philip were dropped into it beyond their necks right up to their eyebrows with the queen at the center of press and public criticism she would need philip in his dual role as husband and consort more than ever Philip was in Argentina when uh, the fire broke out, and he spent long hours that evening on the phone to, uh, to the Queen, trying to comfort her, because she was absolutely distraught by what was happening. Philip decided he would take a leading role in the restoration project, and it's just the thing that a practical man like he uh, could get on with really well and uh, oversaw practically all of it and I think that was that was hugely important moment within their marriage really metaphorically he couldn't mend his children's marriages but what he could do and be useful doing was restore Windsor Castle we have reports from Paris that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a... The sudden and shocking death of Diana in Paris was another terrible setback. The surgeons fought for two hours to restart her heart. At three o'clock this morning, London time, they admitted defeat and announced that Diana, Princess of Wales, was dead. The decision to remain at Balmoral in the days that followed caused public uproar. But it was a family decision and one Prince Philip was at the heart of. The Queen and Prince Philip took the view that when Diana died, the children who were already at Balmoral should stay at Balmoral and that the family should hunker down together in Scotland, looking after those boys and wrapping their arms around them. Philip would have been very instrumental 
people in them staying up in Scotland because he would have known the way a boy gets over stuff is doing stuff, activity, climbing a tree, and also running, physical exhaustion, so they would actually sleep at the end of the day. All of those things would have been part, if you think about it, of the training that Philip had had. He's always done exercises all his life, and I think he would have thought, this is what might help the boys through the next couple of days. But they did eventually come down to Buckingham Palace. Uh, someone handed a bouquet to the Queen and said, look after the boys. And he said, well, that's exactly what we have been doing. That's what we've been doing. He was very much the, the grandfather then. And he continued to, to nurture and guide William and Harry through those dark days following Diana's death. These people are waiting to see the People's Princess pass by on her last journey. And the royal family are at the gates of Buckingham. Alice waiting to do exactly the same thing. Just as it was behind closed doors in Balmoral, Prince Philip's role would be just as pivotal on the very public day of Diana's funeral, as millions watched around the world. I wondered where the Duke of Edinburgh was when I saw the gates of Buckingham Palace. I should have thought of it. He, of course, uh, going to walk to a gentleman of 75 years old. Philip played a very big part in the way the funeral played out. Charles Spencer wanted to walk the cortege himself on his own and the two Charleses fell out over this and it was solved and sorted by Prince Philip who stepped in and said look I will walk as well and as a result the two Charleses the two boys and Prince Philip all walked that long walk from St James's Chapel to Westminster Abbey there was controversy over whether or not the boys should walk behind their mother's coffin there was some pressure Think from Downing Street that they should be seen to do so um, and in the end will you walk and so they did walk behind the mother's coffin something that Harry to this day feels was not right for such a, a young lad um, and was very traumatic for him but there is a moment when the coffin passes under an archway of horse guards and you can see I think Philip just put a, a little reassuring hand on William's shoulder he was there by their side and giving them some very important and much needed strength Prince Philip is known as having this gruff get up and go side to his character, but he also has a, a very emotionally intelligent and sensitive side, especially to family things, because he had a very tough childhood himself. So I think because of that experience, it actually makes him more, not less sensitive to dealing with family problems. Toward the end of yet another tumultuous royal year, the Queen gave a speech on their 50th wedding anniversary, reserving special and rare public praise for her husband and consort. He is someone who doesn't take easily to compliments, but he has quite simply been my strength and stay all these years. And I and his whole family, and this and many other countries, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim, or we shall ever know. When tragedy has struck, or when the monarchy has looked as though it was going through a, a rocky period. That's where Philip has really come into his own. He's a very unflappable sort of character. He's a real leader and a tower of strength. The Duke had been instrumental in helping the Windsors navigate the most turbulent years of the Queen's reign. And thankfully, brighter times were ahead. By 2002, the dark clouds over the royals lifted as the British people out in their millions to celebrate the Queen's Golden Jubilee. Prince Philip was, as ever, by her side to share in this momentous occasion. If ever the, the monarchy came close to real serious difficulty, it was, it was during the 90s. But really, by 2002, the reception that the Queen got for her jubilee just made all of that decades disaster go away, really. For Prince Philip, as the strength and stay of the monarch all of these years, he wanted to milestone himself and um, 50 years on the throne was significant for him as her partner and right-hand man and um, he also enjoyed seeing the crowds so he was very much in tune with those who were coming out well wishing and enjoying it on behalf of his wife and suddenly it seemed like they were having a royal renaissance the royal family's popularity was at a high thanks in no small part to the duke of edinburgh's unerring support but fresh challenges would be just around the corner for the queen's loyal consort the 
moment of reckoning for Prince Philip. Two thousand and eleven saw the Duke of Edinburgh celebrate his ninetieth birthday. What I just want to do is to welcome you all here on this hundredth uh, birthday party. Uh, hundredth, you know, it's not ninety. I remember seeing him around about that time at Buckingham Palace, and um, he'd been a little bit poorly, and then he came across, and uh, I said, oh, it's good to see you, sir, good to see you looking so well. And he looked me up and down and said, oh, you're not looking so bad yourself, actually. So he still had a twinkle in his eyes. <laughs> the Queen had a fitting birthday gift lined up for her husband, awarding him the post of Lord High Admiral of the Navy. Philip, Duke of Edinburgh as we seek thy blessing upon him as Lord High Admiral. Obviously, he'd much rather have stayed in the Navy and earned that title, but he knows that that wasn't to be. He had another job to do. And that job which he took on and which he's adhered to all these years is simply to support the Queen in everything she does, first and foremost. Although when asked that, I mean, he said, regrets? What's the point of regrets? You know, there's no point in regret. See, practical man, no point in regretting. This is what it is. Get on with it. <laughs> Nothing typified the Duke getting on with it more than the rain-soaked Diamond Jubilee of 2012. But on this occasion, Philip's dedication to duty came at a price. He stood there in the rain, as did the Queen. Uh, there seemed to be no shelter at all, and unfortunately the next day he was taken to hospital with um, an infection, and we realised that uh, he wasn't going to be able to take further part in the, the Jubilee celebrations. It was a journey they should have made together. But today, the Duke of Edinburgh's place was taken by Lady Diana Farnham. To many, it was a sign of things to come for the 90-year-old consort. That first time we saw her without him, and you knew that he would have been normally his normal two steps behind, we suddenly thought, oh, is this how it's going to be? The Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall joined her on her carriage procession. But Prince Philip should have been there, and it did not feel the same without him. In 2017, the Duke of Edinburgh brought the curtain down on over 65 years of royal service. At one of his last engagements, someone said, oh, I'm sorry to hear you're, you're standing down. He said, <laughs> he was feeling uh, physically that maybe he should take it, uh, take it slower. But stand up he did. For the last of his months as royal consort. And again, it was one of those days, if you hark back to 2012, that river pageant, it was chucking it down. Well, it was raining, it wasn't quite chucking it down, but he was in his raincoat and he had his bowler hat on and he went out there at 96 to meet the soldiers, the representatives of the Royal Marines and the officers to say goodbye. And that would have been quite a wrench for him because he'd been Captain General of the Royal Marines, so it was pretty important. He doesn't do miss the eye, he doesn't get a in his throat. He's not that emotional. But, you know, there, there is life at the end of the tunnel and giving one job up and going off to do something else and doing something else was um, sorting out the Sandringham estate. And it was near the Sandringham estate in 2019 that there was to be another unscheduled public appearance for Prince Philip. As he was driving out, the sun was in his eyes. He didn't see a car coming from his right. And as he drove out, he was hit by that car and the Range Rover was knocked on its side and sent hurtling over to the other side of the road. Surprise, surprise, and by miracle, the Prince Philip got out of that car with just a few scratches. I remember writing a story saying that he had walked into his private secretary's office shortly afterwards and asked him for a plaster, and then only really told him about the accident when it was sort of coaxed out of him. So it was made more of a big deal than perhaps Prince Philip wanted it to be at the time. Luckily. The other passengers were not very badly hurt, but it was a moment, moment of reckoning uh, for Prince Philip, who by that age of uh, 97 was quite old still to be driving. He apologised, and I think he has said he will no longer drive on public roads. But since then, there's been a picture of him driving on Windsor private roads. So you can't just get this man down. I mean, he's not going to... 
up his independence. This is who he is. And uh, I rather admire him for that. The British public has long loved Prince Philip because of, and sometimes despite, his colourful character. <laughs> but how will history view the self-sufficient alpha male who gave up a promising naval career in deference to a life of royal service? In his position as consul to the Queen, he's been able to achieve so much more than he would have been as a commander in the Royal Navy or, you know, I mean, what was he before that? He was basically a, a penniless, exiled prince. Oh, idiot. He is an action man. He's a doer. And so he has carved out areas uh, that meant a great deal to his uh, hosted design awards. He has started the Duke of Edinburgh Awards scheme. All these things meant a great deal to him. Um, and they are all about one, one thing in particular. They're focused on getting people to do things for themselves. That's what he wants. He wants people to learn by experience and explore this world. Driven by an unwavering focus on duty before all else, perhaps Prince Philip's greatest achievement has been transforming the role of conventional consort into one more like a king, with no need for a crown. For those who believe that the monarchy is of some use to this country, I think he's an immensely important and influential figure. Here we are, we still have a monarchy, a monarchy that is the envy of the world. Go into a news agent everywhere. It's our royal family on the front of every magazine. We have the fairy story at the head of them all, and he's helped keep it there. But when it came to compiling the guest list, there was one decision that indicated just how sensitive the establishment was to Philip's background. Prince Philip's sisters were not invited to the wedding because they were married to quite high-ranking German officers, and one a member of the SS. His father had died during the war, so the only member of his family there was his mother. It was a decision that deprived him of family support on the big day. I think he was a little hurt, but it was probably the right decision because there was still a very, very strong anti-German feeling in this country. It must have been very difficult for him, but I guess he just went with the flow, basically. There were, certainly, there's no evidence of any arguments about it. There was a sort of feeling that he was up against it. He had a sort of fight on his hands um, during the early years of his marriage and to sort of establish himself, find a role for himself and a role in the country, really. Every father will understand this father's pride and delight in his young son. And almost a year later, Charles, the heir to the throne, was born. But for Philip, there was another indication of where the real power lay. It had been decided by Churchill and others that the couple's children wouldn't take his family name, Mount but hers, Windsor. He said, you know, I'm nothing but a bloody amoeba. Some sort of happier compromise um, might, might have been found, but I think it definitely, you know, it, it, it created problems in the marriage, I think. <laughs> 